Over the course of this video, I want to show you um, cutting and simulating. So programming and simulating this pretty simplistic mold here. Okay, so we're going to look at what goes into creating an accurate simulation, right? And and you can put together a simulation really quick that that does something, right? So I could go in here real quick and drop in a um, a generic Haas machine. If you don't have anything in your list, you could use the mill default. But if you want to use like your Haas machine, you would go to manage list. You would grab that three axis Haas machine, hit add. It will show up in your list here. So once I add that three axis Haas machine, I can go into tool paths, contour. And very quickly, selecting right off the solid, right? I can make, I hit the green check button here. I can make a tool path inside a master cam. That was easy, right? And I can go uh, right to verification and I've made a simulation. Now, is that simulation accurate? Is that what's going to occur on the machine? The answer is probably not. Mastercam's intelligent, intelligent about making some guesses to make things work uh, quickly and give you some results. But the simulation is only worth the amount of effort you put in to make it accurate. Right. And that's what we're going to cover in this video. How do we make that simulation as accurate as possible? And there's three components to that, or uh, and basically it's your tooling. So it's the tool, right, that we're looking at here. That's that's important. That's got to be accurate. That's got to reflect what you're actually going to use on the machine. The second part is fixturing, right? What's the vice? How is this part? This part doesn't just float in the air like we're showing in the simulation. In order for that simulation to be accurate, you need to reflect how you're holding that part in the machine. So that's fixturing. And then next is stock. So the stock is represented by this pink chunk of material, but that's not accurate, right? We just guessed, or Mastercam just guessed at what we wanted for stock. It just took the extents of the toolpath and made stock around it. So without those three things modeled accurately inside the system, your simulation is worthless, right? So we're gonna walk through uh, first tooling, how do we make that tool accurate? Second, we're gonna go talk about fixturing and how do we make that fixturing accurate? And then third, our stock, different methods for creating accurate stock inside simulation. So we'll cover those three things um, in depth here and over the course of this video. And one of the reasons for having accurate simulation is to prevent errors on the machine. So let's look at a couple videos where those errors happen. Okay, so you've just seen something bad happen on a machine and then Mastercam verification showing an example of something bad that's going to happen on the machine that we can prevent before we get to the machine. And like I talked about, tooling, fixturing, stock. So let's look at tooling first. Um, and if I look at back plot here, right, there's two, when I say tooling, I talk about a couple different things here. Tooling, um, some people will refer to tooling as fixturing as well, but we're gonna separate those for the, for the sake of this conversation. So when I'm talking about tooling, I'm talking about this white section of the tool, right? The actual end mill or the actual tool, drill, uh, whatever you may be using, chamfer mill, that's the tool. And then you've also got this red thing, right? That's the holder. Now, Mastercam will automatically grab this, what I like to call the hockey puck. And the hockey puck is, to me, the number one indication that someone is not doesn't really know what they're doing with simulation inside a master cam, right? Because that's just a default. When I see a simulation with that hockey puck holder, I immediately say, well, it's not accurate because that's not a real holder, right? So first let's talk about the, the end mill, the tool, and then second we'll go into the holder. So when I'm talking about tools, what I'll normally do, and we're just gonna use MSC for this example, 
because it's pretty generic. A lot of people use it. Um, and we'll, let's just say, uh, let's talk about a bowl end mill first. That's typically what I'll use for roughing. And I'm going to start with a half inch diameter. You can go through an MSC and filter things out. We'll just, uh, for the sake of, I do want to add a little extra cut length. So for corner radius, uh, let's do a 1 16th corner radius and the length of cut, we'll grab a two and a quarter inch length of cut. Okay, so that gives me this MA Ford half inch diameter carbide end mill. You may or may not be using that for the, for the machining, but uh, in this case, this is the one we're gonna talk about here. So if I go in there on MSC, you'll see that it gives me some parameters here, right? I've got that half inch diameter, it's a three flute, uh, 1 16th corner radius, and it's four inches overall, half inch shank diameter. So we want to make sure we model that accurately inside of Mastercam. So I'm going to take this and split it off to the side here. Uh, and we're going to take Mastercam. Let's bump that into the side here. So we're looking at both of these. And to do that, let's go to our toolpath uh, cut parameters. And we already have Mastercam by default is going to grab a half inch flat end mill, which is not exactly what we're using, right? We're using a bull end mill. So I'm going to delete that and I'm going to come in and create new tool. Now we do have a full library of tools and a bunch of default ones inside of Mastercam that you can select from. You can filter. So I could say, oh, I know I want a bull end mill and it's this size and Okay, that's probably pretty close for what you're trying to do here. But to be more specific, we can create the exact tool that we're gonna be using. We know that's a, a bull end mill. We know it's a half inch cutting diameter here. Okay, the overall length, well, we know that's four inches. I'm gonna say four inches. The cutting length here, well, we've got a two and a quarter length of cut. Corner radius. Well, it's not an eighth of an inch, right? We looked at this, this is uh, actually a 1 16th. So I'll put that in. Uh, shoulder length, a little less critical. Uh, this is more critical when you have like a relieved shank on a on a tool. It's gonna default to the, the same as the cutting length if it's long, so that's, that's okay. What this is really gonna control is how far you're allowing the holder to chuck up on the tool, right? Because this is set to only 2.25, that means the tool can only slide into the holder to that point. So I'll leave that alone. The shoulder diameter again is correct and the shank diameter uh, 0.5, but this is flexible. Say I had a larger diameter shank, I can, I can model that. And you should, right? You should, because if you're cutting up against a shoulder, you want the simulation to show you if that shank is going to gouge against the part, right? And Mastercam will show that as a red collision. So you, that should all be accurately modeled. Again, if you had a neck down tool, you can model that too, right? But we're not gonna do that for the sake of this, this discussion. All right, so I've got my tool labeled and whoop, before I get out of there, it's always best practice to give it a, a realistic tool number. Uh, typically a, a Haas machine will have a 20 to 25 carousel on the machine. So anywhere between one and 20 is usually a valid number. Uh, we'll leave this as tool one. Uh, we can give it a name. In case we're going to be using multiple uh, tools, I like to have something a little more interesting or a little more descriptive in the name. So I call this MA Ford uh, end mill. Uh, I also like to, you know, if MA Ford is in the list, we don't have it in there. I like to put the manufacturer in. And then, you know, you can see that the, the manufacturer part number. So if somebody else is going to be cutting this part later on, it's really helpful to know what that what that part number is. So I could come in here and say, well, it's MSC number, uh, let's see, 58198441, right? So now, next time somebody uses this part and opens up this Mastercam part file, they can see what the MSC number that I ordered this tool as, and they could get the same one and recreate the exact same process. Okay, so now I've got the tool. That was part one of tooling, right? Part two is that holder, right? By default, we're using this ugly hockey puck. 
I don't like it, right? I want a realistic looking holder and I, I don't even want it to just be realistic. I want it to be accurate to what we're actually going to be using on the machine to make the simulation as real as possible. Now, just like tools, we have an entire library of tool holders. And if you come down to B4, that's a 40 taper tool. So most cat, most uh, Haas machines will have a cat 40 or a 40 taper uh, tool holder. As you can see, the four, so CAT is for Caterpillar. Uh, they're the ones who invented that taper setup on the CNC machines. Uh, so we'd want to pick from something here, right? Anything in the four range. These are all, I mean, tons of different holders. You can even import libraries from manufacturers. Uh, for the sake of what we're doing here, using our MSC as a, as a case study, we'll say uh, CAT. 40, since we know that's what the Haas machine has, holder. Okay. And we can look at a bunch of different holders on MSC. Uh, let's use a, let's use a, we'll just use a collet chuck holder. And let's see, we need something probably ER, ER 16 will be too small. So ER 32, so something like this will probably work. Okay, this is an Acupro brand. Um, and it's gonna give me some specs here about uh, you know the different projections here. And what I would wanna do, ideally you'd go off to Acupro's website and get the exact uh, dimensions here for the sake of keeping this moving. I'm just gonna show you how we can accurately model this holder to uh, simulate what we've got for real. I mean, you would want to make these um, holders exactly what they are uh, to get the simulation as accurate as possible. But we're just going to create a new one and just walk through what that process would look like. So we know this is a Cat 40. That's what all Haas machines use, or most of them. And we can go through and walk down the holder segment by segment. So this first segment, let's say it's uh, 1.8 at the top and the bottom. Okay, and we'll say it's two inches long, and then it's got that collet nut on there, so we can add a segment, and we know that that's two inches, but I could see here that the overall projection, let's, this is the most important part here, so collet nut diameter, 1.97, so it's not two inches, it's 1.97, 1.97, and the overall projection is 3.13. So that means that this would need to be uh, 1.13, right? So that's pretty accurate. Um, again, you could go out and look at exactly what those holders will look like and put in the exact dimensions that you need to there. So I'm gonna say finish. All right, that gives me a holder, a real holder and a real tool. Now, what you'll notice is that this tool is sticking out four inches, right? Now, is that realistic? Well, no, that means that the holder would be grabbing right at the very end of the tool, and that's not possible, right? It would be holding on to air. The tool would just be setting there. So we wanna create, uh, we wanna make this as realistic as possible against the part. Now, one way I could come in here and just make a wild guess. All right, I wanna stick it out two and a half inches. All right, great. Uh, that may or may not work. But what I can do is I can um, go back to the tool page, right click and say edit projection. Now what this allows me to do is anchor my tool to a spot on the part. And now I can get a real feel for how much I can stick out. So what it looks like here, and then I can drag this in and out. So what I'm seeing here is, realistically, I could have gone with a shorter shank tool, right? I don't need that two and a quarter inch flute. That's just gonna create unneeded chatter, right? So I could have gotten a shorter tool that goes down in there. And if we look at four inches, you can even see inside the part, right? That four inches isn't holding on to anything. So I can see how much I wanna hold on. And, and because that shoulder length was two and a quarter, it allows me to drop all the way down there. So for this part, I want to put that holder down as far as I can. I hit enter here, 
and go back to the holder page, you'll see that filled in for me. Okay, so now we've got, we've talked through holders and tools, and those are very important to get, get uh, precisely what you're going to be doing on the machine. And that's going to give you some clues as to how you should go about programming this as well. If that tool and holder aren't accurate, you're just guessing in the dark about what's going to work and what's not. Okay, we just got done talking about tools and holders and that part of tooling. Now, one of the other things I mentioned early on was fixturing. For an accurate simulation, your fixturing has have to be accurate. Now, you'll hear some people refer to that as tooling as well. For the sake of this conversation, I want to separate those tool thi two things. So tooling, holder, end mill, uh, fixturing, that's going to be what holds this to the, to the machine. Now, most common would just be a vise, but you can uh, toe clamp the part down. You can do a lot of different things. You could draw your own fixturing. If you have it modeled up inside of SolidWorks, bring that in. What I did is I just went to GrabCAD and grabbed a vise, a Kurt 6-inch vise, which is probably what you're going to be using. So I'll go to uh, File, and I want to use Merge. And then I save that, that file from GrabCAD right on my desktop. So I'm going to grab that Kurt vise right off my desktop. And you'll notice there's the full there's the full vise, right? So if I green check here, that gives me the vise into the model. Now, that's great, but, you know, that's not accurate to the machine, right? I want to actually position this thing in such a way that it matches uh, what's happening on the machine. So that would be moving this vise into the proper position. There's a lot of different tools in Mastercam for doing that. Um, in order to stay as as uh, organized as possible, right? I want to keep everything on separate levels to allow myself to to manipulate the parts separately. So if I put the the take shut the part off, um, you'll see that the vice is on this level two thousand, which I'm going to rename as Kurt six inch vice. Grab that part and I can go to transform dynamic and I'm going to grab, let's go into 3D mode here. And I'm going to grab the top center of that part of that vice. Now I could go back into my levels if I want and turn that part back on for reference. Okay. And I could take this and drop it down to this edge here, drop this back to here and slide the X over snap to the center point here, okay? So, and you're getting a preview of what that's gonna look like. Now that's okay, but that means that I'm not holding onto the part by anything, right? The vice jaws aren't there. No, instead, I wanna get that, I wanna grab onto the part by a half an inch, okay? So that allows me to, to put that vice in the proper position. I just hit enter there on the part. Now. We also want to simulate clamping that vise. You know, if if my tool were to come across the front of this part and I have that vise in my simulation, just like I'm showing here, it wouldn't show a collision. But in reality, that vise jaw is going to be uptight against that part. So we need to simulate that properly. Now, also, there will be parallels underneath the part, right? There would be a parallel holding this part up. So you would probably want to draw that as well. You can get as crazy as you want with these simulations to make them as accurate as possible. So, but what I am going to do, even for this little exercise here, is snap to that point. I do want to slide this jaw in up against the part. Oh, too far. What did I do there? Hold on. Try again. Click something wrong. There we go. Okay. So now that's that's a pretty accurate representation, right? I can clear the colors on that. So, I mean, you can go as crazy as you want here too. I could also go to model prep, change face color, and the Kurt vices are, you know, usually 
blue. Right, so I can make a more accurate rep representation there of the curve voice. Um, so now we've got the vice in there. The next thing we want to talk about is stock, right? The stock, in order to get an accurate simulation, the stock needs to be accurate. So when we're talking about stock, Mastercam can handle this in a couple different ways. Um, the way that I think is the easiest way to explain and the easiest way to do this is literally just modeling your stock. I'm going to shut that curtain vice off so I can see. And the way that I would do that is draw the exact piece of metal that I'm going to bolt into the machine or clamp into the machine that I'm going to cut this part from. And in this case, I've got that drawn on level two. Uh, if you're more comfortable with something like SolidWorks, you know, you can draw all these components in another software and file, just like we did with that vice, merge them into this file and then organize them inside a master cam. So I've got the stock drawn here, and if I overlay the part on top of it, you can see the parts on the inside. Now, having the stock drawn, what that allows me to do is very easily select it for stock inside of Mastercam. And I do that inside here, stock setup. So I can go in and I don't need to have this drawn on my screen. I can go in very easily and just define this parametrically, uh, define that stock on the screen. But instead, I'm going to select it right as a solid. Okay. Now that now that is Mastercam knows that that's my stock. I can shut that off now because we know if you want, even in this stock setup, you can turn on the display for stock and that'll show you, you know, just a little outline of what Mastercam is reading as the stock. I prefer to have that off. I prefer to shut that display off. Okay, so now we've I mean, that's that's all there is to stock. Realistically, it's it's a pretty straightforward thing. We're going to touch on it again um, when we get into uh, programming this a little bit. We'll, we'll talk about another use case for stock and simulation, uh, and that's what we call a stock model. So that's when I say stock model, I'm talking about here on the toolpass tab. We'll talk about that once we get programmed up here. Okay, let's talk about a couple things with um, going through and actually running a simulation. We'll go from a very basic simula simulation to something that's that's a little bit more complex. We're going to run through that and then also utilizing stock in different ways. So I'm not going to go through programming this part. There's a lot of resources online on how to do that. Uh, there's even resources covering what we're talking about here. I just wanted to do a very specific one um, for you guys. So we've got this programmed at this point, and I want to simulate that. Now, there's three different grades of simulation in Mastercam. There's what we call backplot, which is just showing the tool, uh, the motion that the tool is going in against anything that you have displayed on the screen, good or not. Right? It doesn't, it's just, you can put whatever you want on there. It's just showing the tool. It's not showing any collisions, not showing any material removed. The one that I think is more valuable and more of a deliverable for you guys would be verify. Uh, so I can go in and do a verification. Because we set our stock up and told Mastercam what our stock was, we now see that that, that, that uh, block of material is pretty accurately displayed to what our actual stock would be. Now we have all these toggles up here where I can turn on the workpiece. Uh, that would be the part that you're cutting and I can change it to translucent uh, I can shut off the workpiece. I can also display different portions of what we'll call the, the tooling, right? The holder, the shank, uh, the cutting length. You know, we can turn on different, different aspects of the tool holder, right? Um, we can even leave the initial stock on. So you can do a lot of things there. So if we go through, I'm going to shut the workpiece off. I'm just going to go straight to... Uh, the stock here. And when we run through this, it's actually removing the material just as it would master camp. And it's giving us the stats about the tool path here. Okay. I'm not going to cover speeds, feeds, uh, the time elapsed in this. We're really focusing on simulation. But when you do the actual simulation, these times are accurate. 
So you should look at the cutting parameters for the tool and make sure that your chip load, your spindle speed, your feed rates, those are all correct uh, in order to get an accurate simulation. So you see that it re removed the material. Um, I can also now turn on the workpiece back on. You can see where it left material, right? Um, so you can see that there's definitely material left on the part. Now, do I really want to leave that much on in the roughing pad? Well, I mean, that looks like a lot. I don't necessarily know exactly what it is, but let's let's see what we've got there and make sure that's what we wanted to do. If I come back into this uh, OptiRough, you'll see that I was leaving 50 thousandths on the part, which was probably not intentional. That was my, uh, my first go at it. So it's always a, a test and revise thing. Now I can regenerate that, go in and re-verify it, rerun the simulation, and you'll see that this is accurately depicting exactly what's happening at the machine. So I get a real feel for what kind of material I have left. So a neat tool inside of verification is underneath the verify tab, compare. So if I turn on compare, I can set different fields for what different colors represent. And when I run that, it's going to go through and calculate that out for me. So I can see how much material I have left in areas. And you'll notice these corners are the worst case, right? You can see I've got at least 40 thousandths left in those corners on the walls. Even though I specified 10 thousandths, which is green, you can see there's areas where it's leaving more. So I need to be aware of that, and that helps me make decisions moving forward. And the decision that I'm probably going to come to from this is I need a smaller tool to go in and rough these corners out. So let's kind of walk through what would be involved in, in going down and stepping down to the next size tool and, and utilizing what we have from this simulation where it's leaving stock to control that next tool path. Okay, so I'm back in the MasterCam interface. What I'm gonna do is create a stock model underneath that first tool path. I'll give it a name and I'll call it after roughing. I can also associate a color with it if I want. Not important, but you can. And initial stock shape. Uh, I can just use the stock setup from MasterCam. That's going to automatically reselect that model that we picked for stock originally. Uh, the source operations, what this is going to do is this is going to take that initial stock shape, apply these tool paths to it, that dynamic OptiRough that we had first, and then generate a mesh in the background that represents that stock, right? So this looks very similar to what we were seeing in Verify, right? This is Verify, and then this is the MasterCam stock model. Okay, so now we're starting to see that stock develop, and I can shut this on and off uh, just like I can any toolpath by pressing the T key or the toolpath display key. So I'm hitting the T button on my keyboard there. Okay, so that leaves, uh, so we can see where that stock is. And now when I make the next tool path, I can tell it that this is where the stock is, right? So I can copy this first tool path down after that stock model, go into the parameters here. And now we wanna talk about, a, now we wanna do a smaller tool. So I'll create a new tool, uh, this time again, a bull end mill. And this time we're gonna do a diameter of a quarter of an inch, okay? And that's fine. That's all good. Cutting length. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, finish. Now remember, we want a good accurate holder. If I see a simulation with this hockey puck in it, I know it's wrong, right? I know that that's, that's a very amateur simulation, right? It's not accurate. It's, it's not going to give me any value. So I want to come down to, you know, either create my own toolpath or, or create my own holder through the methods we showed earlier, or just pick one from the library. And picking one from the library is fine. Again, with uh, going back to the tool page, I can edit the projection. Lock that tool down here, and now I can see how much. Now, the, the idea is to get as low as you can 
because that will allow you the most rigidity from your tool because you're grabbing by as much as you can and only sticking out the very minimum. Hit enter again, uh, and that goes back in and populates that field. Now, typically a big weird number like that is hard for someone to set up on the machine. So I like to round that off so it's easier to set up on the machine and round up a little bit uh, to get that on the, get that a little bit more straightforward. For stock, I'll turn on rest material, one other operation, and now we'll pick that stock model that we had, right? And again, I can leave the same amount of stock because I'm gonna go in and finish this later. So we'll green check and regenerate. So now this toolpath is trimming itself based off of where there's stock on the part. It knows that this whole pocket is empty now, right? It's not gonna spend a ton of time going in and cutting all that part. You can see these are just link moves across the pocket. It's not going through and cutting the whole part. That would take hours again with the smaller tool when all that, that's just air. We don't want to machine air, right? So let's look at making our simulation more accurate, right? I could grab both of these operations and launch verify and watch it run right through. But as I'm programming, I really want to only, I'm only concerned with this second operation. And I, if I just did the second operation and launched verify, right, and I hit go, well, this is not, this is not good, right? That, that tool's jumping across that material, gouging, probably going to break the tool. Uh, this, is, this is far from ideal. Uh, and realistically, it's not accurate because that material would already all be gone. So I'm going to abandon this. What I want to do is go into my verify options and, and give verify a little more heads up at what state I'm in in the, in the machining process. So I'm going to say my stock for this verify operation is not the stock setup, not that square block, but instead that stock model that we created called after roughing. Now when I launch verify, you'll see it starts with the stock as we left it from the first operation. Now I go in and run this, and you'll see now those jumps across the pocket make more sense, right? The tool's only hitting where there's material. It's hitting those little cusps as it walks down and really taking material out of these corners. So if we let this run all the way through, we'll do another compare on this, and you'll start to see how you're um, getting a lot more, you're getting closer to that finished part model. Okay, so the simulation is complete. We'll go back to the Verify tab, hit Compare, run this comparison, and we shouldn't see any dark green or, or dark blue or in there. And you'll see we see a little bit down at the bottom here, uh, but you'll see that we've gotten rid of a lot more material now. So now we're ready to go in and probably run a finishing path on here and do the rest of the verification. Okay, so now that I have the whole part roughed out, we're going to look at um, creating a waterline toolpath, which I did here. And in doing that, I created a, another tool, an eighth inch uh, ball end mill this time. Uh, I'm going with a zero stock to leave, and I've got a nice little shrink fit holder in here. Okay, so now that we have everything from rough, uh, rest rough, and then finish, we can grab the entire toolpath group and we want to make sure that we're on stock setup now and not on stock model anymore because we want to rough against the total stock and we'll hit verify. So if we run this, you know, we've got the holders uh, modeled exactly as we had planned, right? Exactly as is going to occur on the machine. So our simulation is pretty good there. Then we come back in and we're doing a, uh, a, that quarter inch ball end mill and taking the material out of the corners because otherwise that ball end mill would snap going into the corners. Another feature I really like to use here is the color loop. That allows me to see the different operations and what they're cutting versus the last one. Right. And there are also tools inside of 
the uh, verify where I can record this verify session happening, um, taking different video qualities in that. And then we're also going to go over how we can create a presentation where someone without Mastercam has full control of this verify session. It's just a quick little executable that, that this makes. All right, now it's going to transition over to the finishing path with the eighth inch ball end mill. Uh-oh. Looks like we got a problem here. See all that red? So my the tool is actually not sticking out of the holder enough and it's gouging against the part, uh, which is definitely not desirable, right? That would be a crash on the machine. So Verify is very good at showing me these issues through material removal. So I'm gonna go back into Mastercam now and make sure that my projection is enough because now I see that it's not. Now, had I just had that hockey puck sitting up at the top of the part without a real projection there, I would never see that gouge until I got to the machine and that's what's really important. So let's uh, edit projection and you can see it's pretty clear here, right? So now I can see how far that pool's got to stick out. And we regen that. And now we could rerun Verify again, and now we shouldn't see those issues. The thing that I want to talk about with Verify is, again, that simulation just showed the block floating in air. It didn't show how we were holding it. So had we been cutting around the outside of the part, we wouldn't have seen a gouge against the vise. Remember, we have this we have this vise that we modeled in here. We want that in the Verify session. So how do we do that? Uh, if we go into our Verify settings, our Verify options, we can go to Fixtures. And we could turn on a fixture, and we know that that's on level 2000 here of the Kurt 6 inch vise. Now, when we rerun the simulation, we're seeing that vise in the part or in the simulation. So I can also go into my options inside of Verify, and I can check against the fixture as well for collision checking. So it'll actually see that gouge against the fixture. Right now, I'm for calculation purposes, I have that shut off, but you would probably want to turn that on as well. I also have options for um, stop conditions, so I can stop on a collision, right, or a tool change that will cause the verify to stop. Um, and I got different collision checking options here. There's a lot of really neat things we can do. Okay, so now we can see it's going in and doing the finish. And this time, we're gouge free against the part. So we've got a completed part, cut the way we wanted. Uh, if I go into my compare again, verify, compare, rerun this, we should see, we shouldn't really see that we're leaving any material on. And if we are, we know where we have to address it. And it looks like it's just down in that bottom fillet. We're leaving 10 to 20 thousandths on there. So we might need to go back in with a smaller tool and clean up that lower fillet. But otherwise, we're within spec. We're within 10 thou on the whole part. Uh, obviously, all these fields can be adjusted to show you exactly what you're looking for there. But, but this is just a, a rough overview of using uh, Verify uh, for, simulate, for a simulation platform to simu accurately simulate how the machine will remove materials. Again, I want to reiterate one more time that the most important thing with getting an accurate simulation is the tooling, right? The holder, the tool, all that must be very accurate. Uh, next would be the fixturing, right? We want to be able to see where that fixturing is so we can see that crash. Show the crash video here. The last thing is we need our stock accurate. If our stock is not accurate, then there may be stock in places we don't think it is and we can leverage uh, things like stock models to, to uh, more accurately represent what stock is on the part uh, when we're going to machine it. So the next thing I want to look at is machine simulation and we're going to look at what that looks like. Now the last thing we want to look at here is machine simulation. Um, so under the machine tab Let's make sure I've got all the operations selected. Underneath the machine tab is machine simulation. I can hit that 
little arrow there. And then I could select the machine that most accurately represents what we're going to be machining on. And in this case, it's a three axis uh, vertical machining center. Now, keep in mind, this doesn't have the sheet metal on there, but that is a very accurate representation of a VF series Haas. So that's what it looks like without the sheet metal on it. Okay, and for now, we'll just simulate and we'll see what we get and see if we need to adjust anything to get, a, get an accurate simulation. So machine simulation is uh, populating here. Once it's done, it'll pop up, but that pops up in another window. Uh, and I have the ability here to, so I can turn on the workpiece, right? So now I'm seeing the vise and the part. Uh, you can jog axes, right? And I can see see how when the, mach the tool hits the machine, I'm getting a red collision. So this allows me to see you know, if your part was positioned, was too big for the machine, it could also see the travel limits are shown on this part. So it would also indicate travel limits on the machine. Uh, so this gives, this is a little bit more realism in the part uh, as it shows, you know, not only the material removal on the part, uh, which we have the ability to show uh, inside here as well, but it also shows that machine movement. So it's just another aspect and something else to play with. Um, and in here, you have the ability to, as we were talking about an executable, you could create a presentation, um, create presentation, and this will create an executable that someone without Mastercam will be able to launch this exact same window and have the same controls, be able to see collisions on the machine, see how the material is cutting off, how the tool is moving. Uh, and how that machine is behaving as it cuts the part. So that's another really powerful tool with MasterCam simulation.